They are intricately handcrafted. The showpiece of any home. And they offer important spiritual support. They are Butsudan. Each day at these home Buddhist altars, countless Japanese pray for their family's well-being. The lavish craftsmanship featuring intricate carving, gold leaf and gold dust generates a sense of an afterlife in paradise. This time on Japanology Plus, our theme is Butsudan, Buddhist altars. We explore their significance in everyday life in Japan. Hello and welcome to Japanology Plus, I'm Peter Barakan. I'm up in the mountains of Nagano Prefecture in a small town called Iyama which is famous for its Buddhist altars, or Butsudan in Japanese, which you'll find in a great many Japanese homes. This street alone has over a dozen shops specializing in these altars, which must be some kind of a record, especially for a small town like this. The chances are you've maybe never seen a Japanese Buddhist altar, so let's get acquainted. This is the main hall of a temple, where people come to pray before a Buddhist image, in this case, Amitabha or in Japanese, Amida. A butsudan is much the same, only in miniature. Featuring a Buddhist figure and images of ancestors and lost loved ones, it is a convenient setting for everyday prayer. Butsudan come in a number of different regional types, in warmer locations, they are made of tropical hardwoods, and the natural beauty of the wood grain is emphasized. In contrast, this style makes lavish use of gold leaf and lustrous lacquer embedded with gold dust. The rich golden gleam represents the promise of Buddhism's pure land paradise. Let's look at the layout of a butsudan. The recessed central dais is called the shumidan. Everything above it represents the divine realm. Everything below it, the mortal world. Above the shumidan is the kuden, a miniature version of a temple roof. Beneath this roof is the sacred Buddhist image or statue. One level lower than the dais is where the memorial tablets are placed. Each tablet, Ihai, is inscribed with a special Buddhist name and represents the spirit of a deceased person. A butsudan always has three features that enhance its ritual appeal. First, incense. The smell of the incense fills the room a reminder that divine mercy extends to all equally. The incense is also believed to purify the person praying at the Butsudan. Second, flowers. They are arranged to look as beautiful as possible to the person praying. Beautiful flowers have a universal power to refresh the spirit, and they too represent divine mercy. Third, candles, which represent not just mercy, but also divine wisdom. This wisdom is expressed as a divine light that illuminates hearts darkened by worldly desires. A butsudan is an entire sacred cosmos within a wooden cabinet. Our guest on this edition of Japanology Plus is Kazunori Jokai, the 11th generation owner of an Iyama butsudan supplier that's been in business for 300 years. He strives to preserve Buddhist altar customs and traditions. First, we visit the Iyama City Museum of Traditional Industry.
I was wondering why a small town up in the mountains like Iyama would become famous for Buddhist altars. Well, the Iyama area has a long tradition of strong Buddhist faith, and it has extensive forests that provide ready access to the necessary raw materials, including wood and lacquer. Being an inland valley, we have hot, humid summers that are suitable for curing lacquer. And in the old days, the snowy winters would keep people indoors. People turned to crafting altars when they couldn't work outside. Are there any distinctive characteristics of altars that come from Iyama compared with other places? Ours are all modular. They're assembled so they can be disassembled later. And our butsudan use generous amounts of wood, so they have a very substantial feel. Another thing is the metalwork, both decorative and functional. We use far more metal fittings than you see in other styles of altar. Many butsudan doors are just gold leafed, but ours feature designs in lacquer impregnated with gold dust. Oh. These are pretty big. Is this, is this like the biggest type? No, the largest type is along here. Here it is. Oh, wow, yeah, that is pretty large. This is 180 centimeters tall, 80 centimeters deep, and at least 120 centimeters wide, even when the doors are closed. Oh, OK, because the doors are all opened out, so it looks even bigger. Inside, you can see a miniature version of a Buddhist temple roof. Wow, it's really intricate, isn't it? And this is all assembled out of individual pieces, joined without nails or glue, which can be disassembled. Wow. That looks, I mean, that has to be pretty expensive. How, how much are we talking about in terms of investment? The price is roughly equivalent to 50,000 US dollars. Wow, OK, that's, I mean, that's like a fairly expensive car. Um, which is, I mean, that's, that's a lot of money for, for something of this sort, at least it would appear to be to me. Iyama is in an agricultural area, and this is the size many farm families have preferred for the past 100 to 150 years. In the old days, people would save up an entire year's earnings to buy an altar. It really was a very expensive item. Please come in. Thank you. Peter visits a farming family's home to see how a butsudan is used. Thank you very much. From the looks of it, this is a very old butsudan, probably made in the 1870s or so. Wow, it it's, looks brand new, doesn't it? In the center is the figure of Amida Buddha. Wow, it, it really gives the, the, the room a whole kind of different feel. As in this house, the altar is usually placed at the back of the rearmost room, which is the most important place in the house. There are photographs here. These are the ancestors, I suppose. Yes, this family's ancestors. Oh. I mean, the idea of a Buddhist altar like this being dedicated to the Buddha but at the same time to the family's ancestors is an interesting kind of idea. Um, I, I'm presuming this is really a uniquely Japanese thing. Well, this household follows the Jodo Shinshu branch of Buddhism, and so the sacred image they use is of Amida Buddha. Mm. The ancestors are off to the side. Mm. In this faith, people chant Namu Amida Butsu as they pray to the image of Amida Buddha. Mm. But then, in their thoughts at least, they will address the ancestors more conversationally, informing them of happenings or troubles in the family. Mm -hmm. How are things done where you're from? Do you have anything like this? Oh, I've never seen anything like this outside Japan. Um, certainly in, in Britain and in Europe, I don't think, certainly in the Christian world, I, I, people don't have anything like this. Uh, I've lived in Japan so long now that I'm used to seeing these Buddhist altars, but it, it still seems very foreign to me in, in, in a lot of ways. 
The Japanese have absorbed an eclectic mix of religious faiths, but the Butsudan plays a key role in supporting the family's identity across the generations. It's very important in that respect too. Altars that are used for generations require major restoration from time to time. I'd like to show you this workshop where they do butsudan cleaning. Hello. Hello. This is before cleaning. See how grimy this piece is? You'll be amazed how clean it gets. The water contains sodium carbonate. That gets soot and grime right off. And since this is made with real gold leaf, once the grime is gone, it will gleam like new. So, how many parts are there altogether? With all the decorative carvings, once they are disassembled, it's 800 to 1,000 parts, many of them very small. Wow, okay. So, to clean all of the parts of this altar, how long is it going to take? It takes only about two hours just to clean it, but disassembling it takes half a day. And once it has been cleaned, it will get a fresh coat of lacquer and some repairs. So one or two months in all. Oh, uh, OK. <laughs> all right, so presumably then the, the cost is not going to be cheap either. Restoring it to be as good as new is still only half the cost of a brand new altar. And a complete job only needs to be done once every two or three generations. Several decades. That's a pretty long time. People in Japan have long prayed to deceased ancestors and have shared a belief that the spirits of the dead watch over them. In the 6th century, Buddhism arrived in a Japan where ancestor worship was very important. In 686, Emperor Tenmu issued a directive for every home in Japan to make an altar with a Buddhist image or scripture. People were to pray at the altar and make offerings. The directive was intended to spread Buddhism, which until then was confined to the nobility. Later, during the Kamakura period, the Confucian practice of memorial tablets for the deceased arrived from China. This led to Butsudan being used to pray to both Buddhist images and ancestors, but only among samurai and noble families. The spread of Butsudan to the common people came in the mid-17th century, a shogunate policy of registering everyone through Buddhist temples was a major factor. The temple registration system was adopted by the shogunate to suppress Christianity. Every family had to be affiliated to a Buddhist temple. People all around Japan started keeping an image of their affiliated temple's Buddha at home and putting it in a cabinet. Ancestor worship eventually became a standard feature of prayers before a butsudan. Each morning and evening, family members pray at the altar. Whenever they have something important on their minds, they will kneel at the butsudan and seek guidance in the presence of their ancestors. Later, they will report how things turned out. A daily butsudan ritual helps children to learn the family's spiritual values and practices. The Butsudan first appeared in Japan 1,300 years ago, but it remains an essential factor in spiritual well-being. In 2011, the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami struck, destroying tens of thousands of homes and forcing many into temporary housing. One thing residents of temporary housing wanted in order to feel more comfortable was a Butsudan. So, many local Butsudan makers began producing and delivering small altars suitable for cramped temporary housing. The Butsudan has retained its place in Japanese hearts across the centuries and amid adversity. 
Next, we'll visit several artisans to see how altars are made in Iyama. First, a maker of metal fittings. Hello. Come on in. Hello. Here, the artisan is making metal fittings for altars. Are you working with, is that copper? Yes, sheet copper. Oh. It's easy to plate, and as one of the softer metals, it's easy to work. Oh. What kind of a design are you doing on this? Well, a butsudan represents the pure land, paradise after death. So I'm making arabesques, peonies and clouds, things like that. The designs are made using cold chisels, which are tapped with a mallet. The artisan here has more than 500 different chisels, some of which imprint standard elements like peonies and so on. But the coppersmith usually creates the design on the fly using various sizes of chisel. He'll do it without referring to a draft. The most traditional method, called nanakomaki, uses a chisel that makes fine dots. Oh. Yes. Oh my God, that's so intricate. By hammering in a backdrop of fine dots, the peony and other motifs are highlighted. An Iyama Butsudan uses more than 300 of these metal fittings. And there'll be 300 of these in one altar. That's right. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> For centuries, division of labor among specialized artisans has been used to make altars in Iyama. Peter's next visit is to someone who specializes in makie laka. Makie is the technique of painting designs in wet lacquer and sprinkling them with gold dust. The exquisite contrast between black and gold highlights intricate designs. Makia was perfected in around the 8th century. Oh, that's really pretty. And it's kind of... There's a sort of thickness to it. kind of sticks out a little bit. How do, how do you get that effect? This is a hallmark of Iyama altars, what I'm using here right now. Oh. Powdered seashells and nikawa, glue made from animal bones. These are mixed together with the glue acting as an adhesive. I paint the mixture on nice and thick, in white as you can see. Over that, I paint the lacquer. Ah, okay. And the lacquer also acts as an adhesive, so when I dab on the gold dust, it will only stick to where I painted. Uh, okay. Varying the density of gold dust can amplify the relief effect. There's all these little panels here, and then over here, these are, I presume these are for the doors, these big ones here. Doors that are also decorated on the inside with makie are a key feature of Iyama altars. And the images that are created with makie also have a long history. Here's one example, a phoenix. Ah, a phoenix. Oh. Yes, the bird of immortality, reborn again and again, a great symbol of eternal life. And here we have peonies and peacocks. Like the phoenix, the peacock is an auspicious motif. It symbolizes longevity. So motifs like the ones you see here are common on the altars we make in Iyama. Next, Peter visits an artisan who makes the miniature temple roofs. This is just amazing. It's so intricate. It's like architecture in miniature, isn't it? Yes, and this roof has almost 200 separate parts. This is really the centerpiece of an altar, the Kuden temple roof. This will be lacquered and gilded to make a splendid Kuden. That's how it's done. 
Underneath, it's wood. Let's see what the artisan is doing today. Takeshi Washimori is 80 years old and has been making kuden for 60 years. Yeah. And, I mean, this is very complicated, this, this whole design. Is there a kind of a blueprint for how to put it all together? None. There isn't? So how do you do it? My master taught me to do it this way, and that's how I keep doing it. So you just, it's all in your head? Yes. You don't have anything at all to go by? Well, I have this. He refers to those marks. Oh, it's just a stick with some lines in it. <laughs> this stick has been in use for more than a century. It constitutes the blueprint for the miniature roof. The fine lines notched onto it indicate the lengths of various pieces and where the joints will be. But only an artisan can decode the marks. And are you the only one in Iyama doing this work now? Yes. Do you have anybody to take over from you? Well, who can say? I have to find somebody to take over. A different specialized woodworker selects the lumber and makes the cabinet enclosing the altar. Another artisan carves flowers, birds, and other decorative pieces out of wood. Another finishes the cabinet with numerous coats of lacquer. Another applies gold leaf to the finished wood. There is even a specialized artisan whose job is to assemble all the parts into the finished product. Eight different kinds of artisans making use of numerous traditional methods contribute to each Iyama Butsudan. That's amazing that he's the last living craftsman of his type in this area, at least. So what does that say about the future of this whole industry. We are making efforts to interest young people in these careers. We give hands-on workshops. We reach out to university students and go to high schools. We give talks about traditional crafts. But in these hard times, it's very difficult to pay a young person enough as they learn the trade. It's very tough. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Matt Alt, and on today's episode of Plus One, I'm in the Ginza to check out cutting-edge Butsudan, Buddhist altar culture. As you might expect in a big city like Tokyo, space is at a premium. So Butsudan have been evolving to match the needs of modern people. That's what this shop specializes in. It's the front lines of Butsudan culture. This is amazing. It's like a, it, it's like a high-end furniture shop instead of a place dealing in uh, religious objects. So can you show me the state of the art of modern Butsudan altars? Right over here. This type is the latest. This is very fancy. Times change, and today, more people don't want a large floor altar. They want a tabletop size. That gives them more options for where to put it. You know, for such a small box, it's actually very bright inside. Traditionally, Butsudan have dark interiors, and some people find that a bit off-putting. They prefer to interact with the spiritual side in a bright setting. The sacred objects inside also have a brighter look. Here's another type. Instead of the traditional enclosed putsudan, this is roofless and open. This is very stripped down. Some people feel that with a cabinet style, they are confining the spiritual presence. We make putsudan so that customers like that can interact with the putsudan at all times. The last type I'll show you hangs on the wall. 
What is this? I can barely even identify this as a Butsudan. This is the very latest in Butsudan innovation. It blends into the interior decor. This is amazing. It's almost approaching modern art. In the old days, it was like a little temple in your house, tucked away in a quiet place and treated with deep respect. Recently, given that it's considered an abode for the departed, more people want it to fuse with their living space so they can feel that their loved ones are always present. So who is your average customer? In the past, it was mainly the recently bereaved. More recently, it is people replacing the Butsudan they inherited. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to show me all of these Butsudan. You're very welcome. So as lifestyles change in modern day Japan, surely the demand must change as well for Buddhist altars. The traditional Japanese style rooms they go in are disappearing. Mm. Homes are smaller now and things are changing in the cities. People feel less attachment to the idea of a specific family temple. There is a generation that either only has space for a small altar or doesn't feel the need for one at all. That's how things are now. Hmm. So how do the people in the industry manage to survive? To be honest, the business is only a quarter or a fifth of the size it once was. Hmm. We've been trying to make altars that suit urban lifestyles better, a better fit in the modern world. That's what we're aiming for. Hmm. Just about everything else is getting digitalized. You don't think a day will come when these will become digitalized too? There are many types of butsudan. The ones we offer embody the handiwork of numerous artisans. A handcrafted quality is something the digital world cannot offer, and we have a duty to preserve that kind of thing. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Driving schools are yet another context where the Japanese national character is plain to see, and they showcase what it takes to get a driving license in Japan. <laughs> 